So with that, you guys, uh, welcome to this evening's uh, Do Drop In. Thanks for coming on by. I was super stoked to have uh, uh, Ben Oakley as our guest tonight. Ben um, works for the Western States Petroleum Association. The Western States, so let's see, I'm gonna see if I can remember this right. 1859, I think Pennsylvania, first, first uh, uh, getting oil, commercially getting oil in um, the US. Obviously the Chumash and other people have been using oil products and stuff for, for thousands of years, but commercially um, early 1800s, about six, seven years later, I think it was 1865, um, folks come out and um, take a stab at, uh, and Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was Petrolia or someplace like that up in Humboldt County and start drilling, doesn't really work. But then right after that, 18, I want to say it's 66, I think, I'll have to double check my numbers, I think it's 1866. Um, uh, Sulphur Mountain, Ojai, group from the the group from uh, the East Coast comes out, starts drilling, and that's the first commercial oil production, modern oil production in um, in California, really that that persists and lasts for some time. And so we've had oil production in California for at least 155 odd odd years, give or take. Um, and uh, part of that legacy was, and Ben can tell us more about this, but is the Western States Petroleum Association is I think uh, one of the oldest or one of the oldest uh, oil industry advocacy groups uh, around, um, certainly in our part of the world. Um, we have larger organizations like the American Petroleum Institute, but, but WISPA is I believe the, the longest serving um, continuous entity uh, for the industry. And so historically we've always had um, uh, uh, very kindly representatives from WISPA have come and talk to our classes, et cetera. The last couple of years with COVID and my sabbatical things, we, we didn't have someone. So I'm super appreciative that Ben has taken the time to come chat with us tonight um, about WISPA. Tell us about what they do. Tell us a little bit about oil and gas extraction in California, broadly writ, what the lay of the land is, all that good stuff. Um, and so uh, without further ado, Ben, Ben Oakley, welcome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate I'm it. I'm um, Round of applause. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thanks for all the students that uh, are giving up their Thursday night to, to join us. Um, I know you probably have a thousand different things you could be doing tonight. So appreciate you spending some time with us. Absolutely. Do you want to start chatting? Want me to put your slides up first? How would you, how would you, what would you like me? How can I facilitate your, uh, let me, if, if you wouldn't mind, let me talk a little bit about my background, Absolutely. You know, how, how I find myself here today, because in many ways, Please. I was a lot like the students uh, just a short time ago. And then, may, then maybe we can jump into the Perfect. slide. Absolutely. All right, so uh, Ben Oakley, I've been with WISPA for going on two years now. And prior to that in the oil industry uh, for about 15 years, mostly on the central coast, mostly in Santa Barbara County. And my background uh, in terms of uh, my studies is uh, environmental science. I have a... Um, degree in geography, but, it, but in my university, it was in the environmental science college. And so we had a whole lot of uh, environmental science background and uh, specialized in GIS. That was something that I really loved and did for, for several years at the start of my career, really enjoyed that. And I uh, got a master's degree in natural resource management. Both of those degrees were from Utah State. And so I, you know, it was about 20 years ago that I was sitting, you know, in your, I was in your shoes, listening to older people like me uh, talk about, uh, you know, the industries and the different jobs and, and different issues. So um, time flies and, you know, you, you'll find yourself in, in this role in, in no time. So the things that you, you know, the interests that you have today and the things that, uh, that you want to pursue in, in very short order are going to be what what your career becomes. And um, I think it's great. I think you have a wonderful ad adventure ahead of you and I wish you all the best in, in all your uh, endeavors. Awesome, so now, okay, so you start off, let's talk a little about your career. So you start off doing GIS, et cetera. What was your first job out of college? Yeah, first job right out of college was on the East Coast. I was working for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency. And we were working on these historic shoreline charts. It was a really fascinating project. We took these charts from the uh, 1800s that were hand drawn. Um, and it, it was 
the uh, the, the agents right? would go out and they'd have these these tables set up and they you know they had this ingenious way of mapping and they'd have someone out there tracing the shoreline and so uh, USGS had these these archives of maps that they want to digitize so they could look at um, changing coastlines over time. So I was in charge of a project that was managing that, uh, digitizing that, turning it into uh, products for, for the government agencies. That was kind of my taste of the working world. Now, were you a, were you a coastal dude? Were you, I mean, obviously you went to school in Utah, but, but was, why Noah? Why, was it just like a job or was it, it was just a job? Cool? Yeah. I mean, I was at Utah state. I was doing remote sensing GIS and it was just a job. You know, I just needed, needed a job. It was kind of a cool one, interesting one. And uh, so, you know, I just kind of jumped in feet first. Uh, cool. then, then, then I found myself where, back. Oh, go ahead, Sean. No, no, go, no, please go, go. Yeah. I, I found myself back in, in California again, and uh, started working in the oil and gas industry. And it's funny because when I, was, when, I, when I was a student, if you would have asked me if I would ever work for the oil and gas industry, I would have told you no, that was not, uh, not my intention. Uh, I enjoyed uh, hiking and biking and being in the national forest. And uh, I thought that I'd be working for the forest service or something like that. And, uh, but, you know, it's, you know, the industry, that's where the work is. I mean, that's where, that's where the environmental impacts are. Those were the, that's where the challenges are, the air impacts, water impacts. And it's really uh, an opportunity to put your skills to use. And um, I just really fell in love with the industry and, and the folks working in the industry. There's a, there's a, a, a real wide array of, um, of uh, educational backgrounds. So, you know, I've worked with lawyers and engineers and geophysicists and then roustabouts, um, real salt of the earth, uh, you know, it's just all sorts of tight, everything in between. And they're, they're wonderful people and very hardworking and creative problem solvers. And I've just never looked back. I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Well, almost every minute. That <laughs> no, that's awesome. I learned, I learned some of my best swear words from oil guys and Navy guys. Oh, uh, I bet. I, I, I have had good times with folks. Uh, I bet. In those fields. So, okay. So, so yeah, I, that's, a, that's a really key point. I think sometimes our students um, coming out of our program, or at least entering our program, maybe it's a better way to say it. I think exactly like you said, like, I could never work for a chemical company or uh, oil and gas company or, or uh, manufacturing yeah, or, yeah, yeah, totally. yeah. And a lot of our students end up doing that and they, they really, I think by and large, enjoy it. One, they get paid. So that's awesome to get paid and actually yeah. be able to pay for rent. But, but also um, it's one thing to say something's bad or I don't like that or I'm not into that or that's not my jam or something. It's another to sort of embrace and, and, and see how you can make a difference and see how you can um, have your imprint on this entity. And in some cases, some things it's easier from the outside and others it's easier from the inside to be involved and, and have a, have more of a role. So I think, I think a lot of our students start off thinking they wouldn't be interested in a particular industry or a particular type of job. And then when they get closer and start to look at it, as you found, it's, there's um, all kinds of other dimensions they didn't realize. Yeah, and another interesting point is that earlier in my career, um, you know, I kind of would, I would keep it to myself. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, entirely proud of working for the oil and gas industry in certain contexts, right? Sure. I thought, well, I don't want, you know, I don't want anybody to know I work for the oil and gas industry. They might judge me or they may not like that. And over time, I've really evolved to, you know, to, to understand that it's, it's, a, it's a critical part of our society. We, we rely on these products to, uh, to, to live our, our lives. And so they, you know, the industry needs people. Uh, there, there is a voice that needs to be to, to be heard. There's a side of the story that's not uh, that's not always heard. That's it, it's important. And so, uh, you know, I'm I'm quite proud of the work that I do. I'm proud of the industry that I work for. And it, you know, it took me a little time to kind of get there. But uh, I I thought I'd share that with you because it's, uh, you know, it's totally. a, it is a challenging space that we're in right now, particularly in, in California. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about that. So, so, so give us uh, the mile high sort of overview of, of what's going on now in terms of California, in terms of production. So I've heard, 
So the different reports I've read, um, things can change rapidly. I think sometimes we also think of oil and gas as, as sort of a, I don't know, lumbering beast to sort of like just, just big momentum kind of thing going on. But, mm -hmm. but some reports I've read, uh, the typical reports talk about California being the seventh uh, largest oil and gas producing state in the US. Others have said third. And so, so I, know, I know it sort of depends on what our year is and whatever, but, but give us the mile high view of, of oil and gas in, in California in 2021. Well, great question. I mean, in terms of seventh or third, I think it's uh, I think it's the it's it's closer to seventh. I think it used to be a much uh, higher in terms yeah. of production by state, and uh, production has declined over time in the state of California. And, but I think even even bigger picture than that, Sean, uh, you know this this is what I think everyone needs to know. And and there's a lot of uh, earnest discussions around energy right mm -hmm. now, and, you know, largely driven uh, because of the climate issues that we're that we're dealing with, the legitimate challenges that we're we're having to deal with as a state, as a country, as as a world, and you know, I think that a lot of these discussions are being had in the absence of some some fundamental understandings about our energy situation. So. If you would, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about just where we stand as a state in terms of energy. Yeah, do you want so, me to pull the slides so, up or? Uh, yeah, not, not quite. Okay, sorry. So, you know, just, just broadly speaking, we are a massive consumer of energy. We are, you know, if California, uh, if California were, were its own country, we would be something like the third uh, largest country in terms of energy consumption. We're, we're a massive consumer of energy. And, uh, you know, we, we import of all types of energy. So this isn't just crude oil, but this is um, uh, electricity. So power, uh, natural gas, coal, renewables, uh, biofuels, et cetera. We import around 70% of the energy that we consume. And, um, you know, if, if you talk about some of the specific energy types, you know, for even for electricity, we import about 30 percent of what we consume uh, for for crude oil. It's it's a lot closer to that 70, something like 68 percent of the crude oil we bring in from outside the state. So so a lot a lot of times this conversation around what what should we do about energy? You know, there's a, there's a transition underway. You know, we understand that. Um but a lot, a lot of times it's framed as if we, we are in this state of energy abundance. And that is just, that is, that's not the case. We are in a perpetual energy uh, deficit in the state of California. And we, you know, we're, we're on the verge of energy blackouts, <laughs> you know, every summer, um, you know, for, for various reasons. Um, but, you know, I just think I would like to dispel this notion that this, there's just this abundant uh, supply of energy that uh, that affords us the ability to just do whatever we want in terms of energy. It's very, it's 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 uh, it's really hand to mouth in terms of of our energy supply. Yeah, I, I guess I would say that we do have a we have an abundance of energy, but whether we can harvest that energy at the moment, tidal, solar, whatever, I think that's what you're speaking to. That there there is this energy out there, but whether we have it, you know, flicking the switch and ready to come into the factory or whatever right now. I, I, think, yes. you're, I think you're right. Yeah. 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 Correct. Cool. And, and so this, this would, um, yeah, if you can pull up the, the slides, yeah. this would be a perfect chance to talk about the first one. Let me close all these and then here we go. Oh, got to share my screen. Apologies. Okay, cool. Great. So this is um, this is a map of uh, the United States and, and our neighbors. And basically, uh, so this is a map of the crude, crude oil pipelines. So the major crude oil pipelines in the U.S. And so so what's obvious, if you look at California, is that we're not connected to the rest of the of the lower 48. Um, and what does that mean? What that means is if we're unable to produce the crude oil that we use on a daily basis, 
we have to bring it in and and we have a few we have a few choices we can either truck it in uh we can we can ship it in by rail or we can ship it in over uh ocean going vessels and the vast majority is coming in over the ocean um so so you know that's that's what sets this up we we are reliant on outside entities for our energy security uh, because of the the infrastructure and this isn't this isn't going to change anytime soon there's no pipelines being uh, discussed between us and other supplies of, of crude oil so we're you know we really have some hard choices when it when it comes to our crude oil supply which by the way is is um, it provides about 90 percent of our transportation energy so you know another another facet of this is that Renewables are um, increasing dramatically in the state of California, uh, just roughly, and Sean, you may know the answer, but I think it's, it's about a third of our total energy is mm -hmm. provided through renewables. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's really quite re remarkable. And growing fast, and growing fast, yeah. Yeah, and, and growing. Um, but the, the, the sticky, you know, the, the, the rub is that the transportation fuels are like 90% crude oil. And so that's a much harder sector uh, or, or area to, um, to, to, to transition to renewables. Yeah, I think particularly, um, in general, I think that's true, but in particular, um, jet transportation and long haul freight, you know, uh, uh, tankers, those two entities, um, uh, very challenging to electrify or to, or to get off at the moment off of um, their traditional fuels. Yeah, no, I, I, you're right. And, you know, so, but even electrifying, there's a, there's a, um, there's a, there's a lot of work to be done. It's, it's one thing to say, we're going to electrify the fleet. We're talking 40 million cars and all the infrastructure that's going to do that. And so this isn't something where you snap your fingers and tomorrow we have an all electric fleet. Right. So th that's what I mean. It's just, it's a challenge. You know, I think um, other sectors have you know it's easier of course we we usually go after the lowest hanging fruit and and so that's that's where the the biggest progress has been made so there's a lot of work to be done in the transportation sector uh and and so getting back to my 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 point is that uh we still need crude oil on a daily basis we need a lot of it to continue you know um powering our our economy so uh, if you move to the next slide, Sean. Yep. So this is the last one. Uh, and so, you know, the concept is if we don't produce it here, we, we have to bring it in as, as the pipeline network dictates. And so what has happened? Um, you know, so these charts kind of tell the story. And if I look, my eyes are getting bad, but I think they go back <laughs> to the, they go back to the 80s. Yeah, it looks like 84. Looks okay, like all right. And, and so what we've seen is that over time, um, demand has, you know, it's gone up and down. And so, so the entire, the entire um, uh, graphic is, is all, all um, what is it? It's all crude oil brought into the refiner. So that's essentially right. reflecting demand, right? And you see it's, it's gone up and down. Um, you know, but relatively speaking, and we're talking about what thirty years, it's been it's been very stable over time. Uh, you know, if if I had to characterize that, I'd say it's it's declined slightly over over the last thirty years, but not by a whole much or a whole bunch. Um, one thing to note too, it dropped off dramatically in the last year, but that's really more of an anomaly. I think that's related to the COVID shutdowns and um, you know, people stop doing a lot of things in a hurry and so we you know that's that's going to bounce back up um so it's a it's a slight decline over time in overall demand and as as you mentioned sean the production in california has has declined as well over time you can see that with a blue figure you know it's california is, is providing a smaller and smaller portion of our uh, crude oil supply over time. And then, so what, what is, what is the trend been? Well, uh, you know, go, going back to the eighties, we relied on Alaska. Then that, they, they are the ones that made up the difference for us when we couldn't produce it in state. 
but over time, it's been increasingly um, met by foreign oil, uh, you know, from different countries uh, sending uh, oil production, their, their crude oil to, to meet our demand. And that's that green, that's that green area. So you can see that it's, it's, it used to be relatively insignificant and now it's, you know, it's, it's the biggest portion of where we got our daily supply. So the chart to the, to the right, this is, I think, uh, 2020. These are the, the leading countries that provide the supply. So Saudi Arabia um, is, is up there. Um, Ecuador. Ecuador, Iraq, Colombia, Mexico. All right. So, you know, there's a, there's a variety of countries that are sending us crude oil every day. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's how, when you go to fill up your car to drive to school or work, or whatever you're doing, a good, a good portion of that is coming from Saudi Arabia. It's coming from Ecuador. It's coming from other countries. Uh, some of it's coming from California. In fact, every barrel of oil produced in California is consumed in California. Um, but a lot of it's coming from overseas. So really, it, you know, that that's kind of the big picture. That That's the story. I think, you know, so I, I think it would help everybody when we talk about what do we want to do about energy? What What's the plan? What should we do? We hear a lot of different ideas. But I think people need to understand the reality, the, the, the physical reality that, uh, that we're facing uh, to, to have a real clear eyed uh, debate and discussion about what to do. Yeah, absolutely. So I, th I think the take home from this is that um, we in California are producing about a third ish, a third ish of what we what we refine, what we what we use um, in our state of California. So we, we by definition are a net importer is what this is telling us. Um, and so I think in the debates about should we shut down off, offshore platforms or, 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 or what have you, um, I think Dan is making the point. I think, I think Ben is making the point. I think some of our other students in our discussions have been making these points, but that, um, you know, we have to um, instantly at least, right, if you shut down this production, it has to come in from somewhere. And um, we in California, and, and Ben can speak to this, but we in California have some of the strictest, if not the strictest environmental regulations in terms of oil and gas production. And so, so in effect, what that would be doing, just so that we're clear, is it would be shunting production from a relatively, um, um, you know, a lot of people looking over your shoulder to places around the world where there isn't as much scrutiny for environmental safety, for worker safety, for for um, you know all that kind of stuff, and that's that would just be a reality if, if tomorrow, let's say, we were just to turn things off. And so that that's important to consider. The other one, though, I'll, I'll ask uh, Ben though is um, the one thing I, I I remember was when I was young, back in the '70s, back in the day, uh, <laughs> when this shirt was like supposedly new or something. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we had the we had the energy crisis, right? The energy embargoes, and so. Um, you know, we couldn't get gas on one day. It depends on, depended on what our license plate last digit was, whether we could get gas that day or not that gas and all, all these things. And, and so there was this, uh, you know, huge push for alternative sources of energy. And the argument at the time was, hey, yeah, we got to do alternative sources of energy, but, but it takes time, right? It, 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 we can't just flip the switch and have it instantly happen tomorrow. So it's going to take, and I remember the quotes were like, it's going to take like 40 years to, to transition to another energy source. And so we can't, we can't stop what we're doing now, but, but we've, we've transitioned and, and all these renewables and other alternative sources of energy are, are rapidly, economies of scale are, are getting better by the day, et cetera. But, but we still seem to be by and large where we, where we were in terms of, um, I mean, I mean, oil and gas production in the state of California has shrunk from from the 70s, but but that 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 notion of we still need to wait, we still need some time. So I'm curious as to how you respond to those those types of comments. So the question is, um, yes, yeah, so the know, question is, so so how much time? So we keep hearing about the need to transition or the need to have a more diverse energy portfolio. What what in your opinion is is a reasonable amount of time to you know, not have displaced workers and all that, all the associated bad things about changing too quickly. What, what do you think would be a, a reasonable 
evolution time for our energy sector in California? Well, you know, it's hard to say exactly, you know, to, to lay out what, uh, you know, exactly what the transition is going to look like going forward. And that was a loaded question. I, I, but, I but, that know, was a loaded question, but, but, but that yeah. certainly is part of the conversation and the state is setting um, carbon goals. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of this is being set up in terms of our, you know, our carbon goals and all of that is, is uh, worked, uh, work work through with the um, California Air Res Resources Board. So, um, you know, we, we, we are setting, uh, you know, net zero and, and, you know, carbon reduction goals over time. So that's really what's being hammered out right now. It's, it's how do we get to a, uh, uh, you know, how do we reduce the carbon emissions as an economy, as a state, uh, and, and, and how fast can we do that? And so that's, that's a debate happening in the legislature. Uh, we, we have some current goals that, uh, that have been set forth. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to quote them off the top of my head. I can't remember, no, what cool. are, but, cool. it's good. But, but we do have, you know, we have fairly aggressive goals in the state of California already. And so um, the question is how, you know, how we go about doing that in, in terms of how long it takes. I mean, for me, I think we just need to keep in mind that um, reliability is important. So, so we should, we should pursue the transition to renewable energy, but we should also, we, we should also do so in a way that makes sure that we have reliable energy so that we don't have the shortages that you, that you mentioned that we saw in the seventies. And uh, you know, affordability is another issue. It's like, you know, the faster you do this transition, the more likely you're going to have, you know, uh, price spikes and, and, and strange costs. And, right. and so I, I think it's finding a balance between meeting the environmental goals, the carbon reduction goals, uh, while, while uh, ensuring reliability and affordability for the folks that live and, uh, and work in California and, and uh, you know, are on a budget, like, like basically almost all of us. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. And I would also say just, uh, uh, to make sure we're all on the same page. So Ben, so WISPA is representing all of their members and, and there is, there, there might be a diversity of opinion on, on transition times and, and things of that nature. Um, but uh, not to put, we don't want to put Ben the hot seat. He has to represent all his membership. So, so uh, he's, he's trying to, give responses that are, that are most fair and representative of his whole, of his whole group. So, so um, if that's a fair thing to say, is that, is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. accurate. Okay, cool. Okay, good, good. Okay, good. Awesome. So with that, I have many more questions, but with that, I'm going to start opening it up to uh, folks that would like to ask some questions of uh, Ben about transitions or production or career opportunities or, or other parts of anything about um, oil and gas production here in the state of California. So, um, uh, let's see. Somebody, I think, uh, who had their hand up first? Uh, was it uh, Lewis or somebody? Wait, I didn't see. Who was it? Who was it? Yeah, that was me. I yeah, sent go my for it. Go for it. Go for it. Um, okay. So, and if I'm not mistaken, California has like vowed to go totally renewable by 2030. And I was just wondering how vi or how viable you think that actually is, or realistic, based on your expertise, Mr. Oakley. Yeah, great question, and uh, you know that that's that's one of the goals that uh, that, that I mentioned that's being um, that's being discussed. I, I think the current goal with CARB is is not quite that aggressive. I think right now the policy discussion is around making even more uh, more aggressive goals for ourselves, including the one that you mentioned, which was um, carbon free by by twenty thirty. And again, I, I think it just goes back to to my comment that you know in order to meet that you know look that that's a that's an extremely challenging goal to begin with and and you nine know, years add, oh that, come on that's easy nine years yeah. come on we could do that <laughs> yeah so you know when, when you add the you know how are people going to afford to to live their daily life? what's what's it going to do the cost of living what's uh, you know, how do you do that without displacing thousands of workers? You know, those are all the questions I think that need to be answered. And, and in many cases, like it's easy to say, 
we should just go carbon neutral by, uh, by an arbitrary date. Well, that's the easy part. The, the hard part is how to actually do that in a way that doesn't cause major, major disruptions to our, uh, to our lives. And so, I th- again, I think that's the balance that we have to strike. And, and so our job, you know, with, with WISPA is to tell the other side of the story um, when, when folks say, well, we're going to do this and, 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 you know, that's just all there is to it. Uh, but we want to make sure it's it's you know we go into it with eyes wide open about what what some of the impacts will be you know in terms of the economy reliability and affordability. Totally, totally, awesome, great question. Uh, I think Kurt, you had your next question up. Unless you unless Lewis, you had a follow up, but I think you were good. I think you're good. Kurt, go for it. Hello. So on April 23rd of this year. Governor Newsom signed an executive order that would stop new fracking in 2024 and stop fracking completely in the state by 2045. So what do you think would happen to these old fracking sites when resources can no longer be extracted from them? Um, well, that's, that's a good question. And just to clarify, uh, the, the executive order was to phase out fracking by 2024 and then phase out all oil and gas production by 2045. So that wouldn't just be fracking. And fracking is um, is just a you know percentage of I think it's something around twenty percent of our of our oil in California is um, is done uh, you know through the production technique of uh, hydraulic fracturing. Most of that in the in the Central Valley. Uh, so yeah. So just to clarify, he wants to phase all the oil and gas out by twenty forty five, not just fracking. Um, well, you know, so before I answer your question, uh, again, I think it goes back to, you know, oh, you know, it's one thing to say that it's quite another to answer all those questions, which is, okay, what does that actually mean in terms of, uh, you know, where we get our energy? How, how does that mean we're going to have, ener- you know, energy shortages, you know, um, so, I don't think it, those questions have been answered. You know, what does that mean in terms of cost? What does, it, what does that mean for working Californians who are just living paycheck to paycheck? None of those questions have been answered. Um, so, you know, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of discussion around that still to be had, I think. Um, but, but to your point, um, right now, there are a number of, uh, of regulations in place that are speeding up the, um, the retirement of idle wells, uh, the the plugging, and um, and uh, cleaning up of, of old well sites, and so uh, those there were there were a couple of uh, of new bills that came uh, in you know the 2015-16 kind of time frame, and and they've been enacted and are you know really starting to gain steam. So. What that what, what what they're doing is reducing the number of idle wells that are that are out there, and so an idle well is a well that's not actively producing, but it hasn't been plugged, and uh, and retired, or you know the the, the term of, of industry is plugged and abandoned, and that means it's been plugged and it's safe and it's no no longer uh, a viable well and it's not a threat to the environment, and so the the regulations that were recently passed have really accelerated the number of wells. And, and they've done that by, uh, first of all, identifying the idle well. So every operator, oil and gas operator in the state has to identify their wells and they have to categorize their wells. And if there's wells that are idle, they have to reduce the number, they have to pay into a, a fund uh, that, will, that will go help reduce the number. And it's, it's been effective. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're seeing a lot of those idle wells Either being returned to production, active production, so they're they're actually, uh, you know, producing, or they're they're being plugged and abandoned, and that's what you're largely seeing. Yeah, and I think also just as a as a quick point of clarity, what I find is um, um, when we talk about fracking in California, I think people have a, a certain perception of fracking, and it's um, some of the more detrimental aspects aren't necessarily associated with our formations and, and our, our type of, uh, of uh, oil, oil deposits. So some of the more um, scary things that we're seeing 
that tends to be more in, in, in Pennsylvania and other, other areas. So I think when people hear fracking, they sometimes um, that don't have experience with oil and gas that they sort of lump a bunch of things together. And so, um, you know, back in the day, we'd stick a straw on the ground and the, and the pressure of the, of the reservoir would, would squirt the oil out, right? And, and, and that happens still, we have a new formation, but we've sort of taken a lot of that pressure out. So that those various techniques, injection wells, squirting steam and other materials into the formation to increase the pressure so stuff will come out. Sometimes that's considered, uh, the public considers that fracking and, and, and it's, they're, they're, they're different things. So won't go into all of them here, but just suffice to say that fracking is um, a specific type of oil and gas extraction. But I think sometimes in the debate and the public discussion, um, anything other than just a straw on the ground is considered, um, is considered fracking. If that's a fair. Yeah, it, it's, it's a very specific technique. Like I said, it's about 20% of the production and um, it's probably the world's worst marketing term. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it sounds scary. It sounds horrible. Uh, you know, frack, but it, um, people have had a, had a lot of fun with, uh, you know, puns <laughs> and what have you, but um, yeah, it's just a production technique, you know, simply. Uh, if Kurt, if you don't have a follow-up, we'll go to Jen next. And that's all. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Oakley. I had a question more focused on your WISPA career. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this before, so I apologize if this is repetitive, but um, how did your career get led into WISPA and what is your position title? Were you always in this position or have you been promoted since you've been with this company and for how long? Uh, uh, great. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, so um, I've been with WISPA for, two, for just about two years now. And this is the same position I was hired into. Um, it's funny because my, my background was, of course, environmental science. And so I started in the industry working on air quality permitting, water quality issues, um, really working more on the, um, the, the, the science side of the business and came up through the industry that way um, at most of my career. And so I ended up uh, for for about eight years, running the environmental uh, regulatory department of a of a local oil company, and so I had to, you know, I had to deal with all the different uh, programs that we that we run. And by the way, there there are there are numerous programs that the, the oil producers adhere to uh, to protect uh, water, soil, air quality, et cetera. It's, uh, it's a full-time job for, uh, you know, a dozen people at, at, at any given company. Um, and so I had the opportunity uh, back in 2014 to do a little bit of public commenting on different things and enjoyed that. I was never a real strong public speaker. It actually was something that, uh, that I, I had a healthy, healthy fear of, uh, to be honest with you. And it, it was one of those things where like, I wanted to be better at that. And I, I sought out opportunities to do it just so I could, I could get better and practice at it. And, you know, one thing led to another. In fact, uh, it was uh, an old colleague of mine who was in my current role now. He, uh, he's just about to retire, but he took a position elsewhere. And he said, you know, you'd be really good at this. Do you want to think about it? And, you know, one thing led to another. And so now I'm doing a lot more of, uh, you know, problem solving, and it, it really helps to have the technical background, the environmental science background uh, to, to talk about some of the issues that we're dealing with, because that's really at the end of the day, what's driving the discussion. And so, you know, I, it's, it's something that I know about that I, that I spent most of my career in. And so then it really helps me to then represent the, the industry when we're, we're talking to elected officials or the public about the issues and, um, you know, what, what some of the potential solutions are. Awesome. So um, I, you know, my advice to you, if you're thinking about your career is keep an open mind and, uh, you know, you know, if, if, if you, if you think you want to end all oh, like, let's, let's just put it this way. I, I, I would never have predicted I'd be doing what I'm doing uh, today, you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, not, not in a million years. So, I, you know, I think just keeping an open mind of 
of opportunity and working hard and, and learning as much as you can and, and not being uh, afraid to take on new responsibilities and skill, that'll, uh, that'll serve you well. Cool, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome, Brittany, Brittany next. Hi, Mr. Oakley, how's it going? Doing, doing well, thanks. Good. Um, if my connection's bad, please let me know. Um, I've been having trouble with it for the past few weeks. Oh, but great. my question was, has WESPA done any calculations or investigating how much the cost of living would rise if renewable energy was like the primary source, like energy source that people used? Or like if they have it, um, in your opinion or on average, how much would it raise? Okay, gosh, that's a good one. Um, I know that we've done we've done a lot of work about the economic impacts of of uh, of some of the policies that we're discussing, and I think I think when we do that, it's usually in the context of a certain decision. Um, you know, like so, if if there's a if there's a law being proposed that will make a certain change, we'll, we will certainly, we always quantify that. And, and so we, need, we think that it's important to bring that to dis the discussion. In terms of what would, you know, what would it cost to go to, um, you know, to a zero carbon economy? I don't think that we've calcul you know, calculated that specifically. I mean, what can I tell you? What I can tell you is it's an astronomical number. It's, it's massive. Um, I, I will say this about our, our industry, you know, we employ nearly 400,000 people across the state. Um, you know, we're, we generate something like $150 billion a year in, in uh, economic activity. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a couple percentage of the total state uh, economic activity, which sounds like maybe that's not a lot, but I mean, it, think about it. It's like several percent of, of everything, every value created in the state is, is this responsible for this industry. So when, when people say, well, let's just make the industry go away. It's like, you know, we're talking about these massive economic impacts that are associated with that. Um, so so, you know, back to your question. No, we don't know what, you know, we don't know what the answer is if we do it all, but we know that for, for most of the different uh, decisions we're talking about, there are quite severe consequences associated with us. I, I agree. I, th I think that that's a, those are real costs and those are, those are real transition challenges. I do think though that also part of the conversation should be not just the calculation of the, of the transition costs, which are steep and, and significant, but also, the consequences of the climate change that we're experiencing in the state that that has to be part of the calculation as well even though that's that sometimes isn't as easy to calculate as sort of job transition and other stuff but but yeah no i, I totally agree Charles, yeah, I, oh, I sorry, was, oh sorry i was just gonna respond but no yeah i was wondering that because i would think um as i don't know if like i would think that would be a good a um not advertisement, what, what am I trying to say? Like it would good, be a good number to have on hand as like a, not a defense, maybe like a put like, oh, I can't, I don't know the a more word. complete discussion? Yeah, like, I don't know. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for answering my question. Thank you. Awesome, Charles, you're next, bud. Uh, how do you see oil and gas being used when in energy when like, Renewable energy get, takes the majority of the uses, hmm. like in emergencies. Yeah, you know, well, we, we talked about this a little bit, right? So it's it's like the lowest hanging fruit. So we're already, you know, we're, we're powering our energy needs by about 30% renewable sources. Uh, so lots of solar on houses, right? You know, as you drive around the neighborhoods. There's a lot of, uh, uh, um, um, you know, large scale solar farms going in. I know in Santa Barbara County, there's a big wind farm going in. Uh, hydroelectric is responsible for a lot of um, bio, biofuels, um, biomass energy. So, 
so so it happens over time in different in different parts of the economy. So where do I see oil and gas? I I think that the role, like if I if I'm honest with you, I think that oil and gas will continue to be a very important part of the economy uh, for a very long time. And, um, you know, it's not just me saying that when, when car models climate change, what to do about it, they recognize that, uh, you know, for example, carbon sequestration is a very important part of it because, you know, there, there, are, there's going to be certain parts of the economy that are just extremely difficult to ever you know, to, to completely move away from, uh, from petroleum. And so the, the idea is then to take those emissions, capture them, and then uh, sequester them, inject them into underground formations so that we can get to our net zero goals, uh, but we can continue to have reliable power. So that's what I see happening over time. We're going to continue to, uh, you know, uh, power the easiest, sectors uh, through renewable sources over time and the, and the more resistant ones. And I think, Sean, you mentioned uh, planes and, you know, there, there are, there's different sectors that are going to be extremely difficult uh, to, uh, to power from renewable sources. And so that, that's why I think carbon sequestration is, is critical. Yeah. And if we had to pick an industry that knew how to move <laughs> move liquid and gas and stuff from formations to other places i would think the oil and gas industry is the um is the go-to entity to figure out how to do sequestration we're uh, here to help there you go there you go awesome uh evan evan next hi um my question was where would somebody go to apply for an environmental job at wispa and um what jobs are offered in the environmental yeah, great question. Um, for one, uh, you know, we we certainly we certainly do hire people all the time. Um, there's positions open right now. I don't know how many entry level. And so, so just so you know, our, we're a trade association. So we we are not an energy company ourselves. We represent those energy companies. And I what I would suggest is just like I did. I worked for the energy companies first. Uh, you know, and then, and then, you know, sort of saw opportunities over time. Um, but I, I would, I would look, you know, for environmental jobs in, uh, you know, with some of the local producers. And I started out as a consultant, a, a, an environmental consultant. And I know there's, there's a lot of local um, consulting firms in that area. And, um, you know, one, one in particular, uh, I, I just, heard from someone today that they do a lot of work in uh, industry. So it's not just oil and gas, but you can do projects in, in manufacturing and industry. And so that's what I would recommend right out of, right out of school, looking for a job with a consulting firm, you'll get to see a lot of different uh, sectors, um, you know, including oil and gas, which I think would be a great place to work. Uh, but you'll you'll learn a lot and get get to see a lot of different uh, a lot of different types of work. And I would just add that um, being the old guy and having seen this gone through various cycles, not just oil and gas, but just in general, um, people that have experience in the private sector, in the regulatory sector, in other things tend to be more valuable. So if you get some of that experience working in in one area and then another and another that tends to boost your value and that you can speak to the, the permitty people and also speak to the people doing this stuff on the ground. And, and that, that accumulation of experience in different sectors is often seen as a valuable um, thing that you would bring to the table. Cool. Awesome. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Evan. I said, thank you. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Uh, Ariana. Hi, um, it's kind of a follow up question. I was just wondering what a typical day in the office looks like for you. Like, what do you do on a daily basis? Oh, great question. You know, it's, it's so strange. I, I work from home. I have a home office. And again, you know, I, 15 years ago, if you, I would have never guessed I'd be doing what I'm doing. But one thing I love is that no two days are ever the same. Uh, it's really... Yeah, I get bored real easy. I got to be honest with you. I, I can barely sit through a two hour meeting. I mean, I just, 
And, and so I love this job because it's, it's really high energy. There's a lot coming at us all the time. But then for people like me that kind of like that, it's, it's really, you know, it fits, fits my, um, my personality well. But, you know, I, I work from home. So most days are, you know, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm at home right now, you know, <laughs> and uh, I do have to, you know, travel some. So that's, uh, that's a good part of the job. But uh, I also enjoy doing some of that. Not a whole lot of uh, international travel or anything like that, but local travel. Uh, a lot of meetings, a lot of business meetings, conferences, um, presentations, do a lot of those. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of it is just sort of like moving information around. And, and I, I do a lot of reading, uh, an incredible amount of reading. Probably every day I spend, you know, two or three hours reading uh, media, reading uh, uh, reports, reading studies. Uh, it's just a big part of the job. In fact, I don't do enough reading for pleasure because I just spend so much of my time <laughs> reading. So uh, reading, writing, I uh, do a lot of writing, letter writing. Um, so communication skills are, are critical. Um, but yeah, I never know where, where the day is going to take me. There you go. Everybody, I keep telling you guys, everybody has to write. Everybody has to write. Every, I know you struggle and think that's lame, but everybody writes no matter what. It's what huge. Job. It's yeah. huge. If, yeah, if you can, if you can write, you, you will never, uh, you'll never be unemployed. Awesome. Jada, next. Hi. So my question kind of, I mean, it's perfect that you just said that you have to read a lot of media. Because <laughs> my question was kind of about, like, especially with all of us having to read so much about the Huntington oil spill recently, a lot of people like just regular people on the streets were saying, how could they be so irresponsible? And like, how can this keep happening? Do you think that that like portrayal that oil companies are irresponsible is accurate? Do you think that they are not implementing policies that they should be? Or do you have an example of like a policy that you've thought of that should be implemented to help stop the spills from happening since we currently don't really have a better option for all the energy that we need? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, first, you know, spills are 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 harmful, and they, uh, you know, they harm the environment, they harm people, uh, they harm animals, and they're they're regrettable and unfortunate. And so, there's really, you know, there's real, no, there's really no excuse uh, for an oil spill, and we we work incredibly hard to prevent. Uh, to prevent those types of incidents. Uh, and just to clarify, the, the companies that I work for are, are not associated with the, uh, with the spill down in Orange County. Um, but nevertheless, you know, that's our industry. We, we, uh, we, we are, you know, right or wrong, we're associated with them. And so it's, <laughs> it's a fair question. Um, you know, as a result of any type of incident like that, we, we think that the, you know, there, there's, there's a policy discussion that inevitably happens about, you know, what can be done, what can be improved. And um, we're, we're already hearing uh, that, that type of uh, discussion starting um, in, in the state legislature and, and, and other places. And so, you know, we, we are not opposed to uh, reasonable and, uh, and, and smart regulations on the industry. And, uh, we've we've supported many many uh, regulations over the years uh, that made sense that protected the environment, protected workers, and uh, protected the economy. And so we're you know we'll continue to uh, to work with uh, the, the state uh, agencies and legislature as this inevitable policy discussion uh, uh, happens over the next um, next year or so as a result of of this incident. And, and maybe, maybe Ben can't say this as representing the industry, but I'll say it. Um, uh, it's not just an issue of bad apples, but there are some bad apples are there out there. And there's some, some a-hole poor behavior companies, entities. And I think sometimes they, they portray, or they're portrayed as a larger swath of the industry. And so there are absolutely some bad actors that do some lame crap and that, that are have poor safety records, but by and large, at least in California, which is where most of my experience is, much 
a lot of attention to safety and a lot of attention to not spilling and all that kind of stuff. In other places, other country and, and, and world, maybe not quite as much. In certain places, definitely not quite as much. But, but um, I've not really, in some parts of the world where I've worked, I've seen people spill oil and they're like, eh, who cares, you know, eh. Uh, and that's not, that's not California, right? People, people don't want to spill and they mostly are, are ticked off and embarrassed when they spill. And there's a, there's a small subset of bad actors that seem to do it frequently or whatever. Um, and, and, and I think sometimes that becomes the characterization of the entire industry or so. I, I think that's a fair thing to say. Even though and Sean, not to put too fine a point on it, but I'll, I'll tell you, I would not work for a company or an organization that, that, uh, that didn't take those things seriously. And, uh, you know, so I worked for a number of companies um, throughout my career in the industry and, and they, you know, we take it seriously. We, we, uh, you know, we work hard. You know, the, the men and women of the industry work extremely hard to protect the environment. We take it seriously. You know, um, you know, the, these companies have a culture of compliance. They want to do what's right. They want to do the right thing. They want to protect their workers. They want everyone to go home safe at night. And, you know, just on a personal level, like I said, I wouldn't work for a company that, that didn't prioritize those things. Yeah, and, and, and in terms of when we look at discharge, just like we've talked about before about how, are we talking gallons? Are we talking barrels? Are we talking percentage? Are we talking quantity, right? Different groups will, will use different uh, 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 a binning of information in certain ways to make it sound worse or better or whatever. Um, but just like that, um, that happens. Um, there are uh, uh, other ways to phrase things. And in terms of spills, um, if you look at the old data, what qualified as a spill, you had to release a lot of oil, depending on the NOAA data or whoever we're talking about. And in recent years, and Ben can correct me here, but I think it's like if you spill like up to like a gallon of oil, that has to be reported, that has to be logged. And so numerically, it can look like the number of incident, the number of spill incidents is, is a huge number. And, and, you know, we shouldn't spill any oil. I don't care if it's even a gallon, but, but right, you, you know what I'm saying? Whereas Whereas um, in reality, even though there's, there are oftentimes are many spills enter, entered into the state database, the federal database, whatever, the quantity is, um, is, is oftentimes quite low. It's not as if, so this, this spill in Orange County is an, is an anomaly by and large, right? We don't have this amount of spill released all the time, but sometimes when we get caught up in the, in the media coverage or the discussion of these things, it, it, it um, we can, we can be tricked into hearing just a raw number and, and assume that that means a, a vast quantity. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, another point, Sean, and I'm, I'm sure you've covered this in your, in your classes, but you know, there's a fair amount of crude oil in the natural environment, right? And you know, certainly in the Santa Barbara channel, um, anyone that's walked on the beach has seen the, the tar that, uh, right. you know, and when I was a kid, I assumed that that was related to oil production. And, it, you know, I had, I only learned like later in life that no, that's, that's most, the vast majority of that is from natural seeps that are happening in, um, in and under the Santa Barbara channel. So there's a whole lot of oil in, in the uh, marine environment in, in California to begin with. Yeah. Uh, not, not to downplay the significance of any, of sure. any incident, but, uh, but, but the reality is there is a lot of, oil, crude oil naturally in, uh, in and, and around the beaches in California all the time. Uh, right, we, we, process. we drilled here because of the seeps. The seeps brought people here. The seeps didn't come because of the people. Um, again, not to excuse spills and stuff, but, but that, that, was the, that was the cycle of events or whatever. Awesome, uh, let's see, who's next? Who did I say is next? Um, bah, 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 bah. That was Jada, I think. Uh, Brennan is next. Hi, um, I was just wondering, as California is enacting these strict timelines to move away from oil and gas, and uh, as California is also already importing a sizable amount of um, its power from other states, are there concerns that you're hearing from other Western states regarding California's power consumption and regarding pollution from fossil fuel burning plants in other states that export power to California? You know, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I'm probably the, not the, the, the best person to answer, you know, inter, 
interstate uh, sort of political and uh, energy uh, dynamics. I know they're there. I mean, you know, we're, you know, we're bringing in power, you know, for, as an example, from other states. And, you know, we still get some of our power from coal, coal-fired plants. You know, they're, they're not in California, but we have, we have coal that's providing a, a portion of our uh, power portfolio in the state of California. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I just don't have a whole lot of insight into those those state dynamics. Uh, it's just I, I, I'm just unaware of it. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering if it was like a big thing in the uh, like oil industry that you discussed. So thank you. Yep. But, but Brent, that's a good thing, right? We've talked about this a little bit about how um, again, you know, shutting down production here means more production is in the Niger Delta, or 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 not manufacturing here means the manufacturer's done in China. And so it might be cleaner immediately for us, but in aggregate, um, sometimes we just shift our environmental burden or, or pollution burden or whatever it is to other, other areas. So it's always good to be, to be thinking about that. And, and the net aggregate, who wins, who loses? I, yeah. I like that question. That's good. You know, th there's another interesting uh, point. And, you know, what was it last summer? We had the rolling blackouts in California. I think it was a, it was a year before, it was 2020. And... Remember, it was a it was a multi-state high uh, high pressure cell, and everybody was experiencing across the West uh, high temperatures. And so they said one of the reasons what you know the cause of the black the rolling blackouts was that we weren't able to get the electricity from the other states that we normally would, right? So the Utahs, the Arizonas, et, et cetera, they kept their own power for their own needs. And we, you know, we usually rely on them, like I said, for, you know, something like 30% of our, our annual supply. And so I think that's, a, that's an interesting illustration as to how, how we're vulnerable to, uh, to other, other areas, other states and other countries to our supply. And, and you know, it, it doesn't take that creative of a mind to see how things can go really bad if you don't have control over your own, over your own supply. Right, and, and I'll, I'll say that that was made worse by climate change than testify that, but, but our own campus is an example of what, of what of that example. So um, you guys are too young, but when we opened up campus it was when this Enron thing is starting. We haven't really talked about that in our class and don't really typically, but basically um, this, this effort to, to change this power supply and these folks that were super smart from Texas were gonna tell us how to get you know, energy on demand, all this kind of stuff. Long story short, it didn't work. And we led to rolling blackouts, um, which uh, caused all kinds of problems. But when our campus opened, the power station that is on campus, and maybe you guys have visited this in ESRM 200 or ESRM 100 or whatever, but that that uh, power plant, which is, which is a, a petroleum fueled thing, it's a natural gas, high efficiency turbine, but, but we entered into agreement to buy the first megawatt of that power for 15 years or, or whatever, 16 years, whatever, whatever the contract was, because we were so freaked out of rolling brownouts and blackouts across, across our state. That is one of the reasons we've only now, this past year in COVID, installed our solar farm out um, on the entrance to campus because we were already in, we don't have much money, right? We're, we're a, a relatively poor state school. Um, we were committed to buying that power thinking that that was a smart thing. So we guarantee power on, but it also, it constrained the other types of, uh, it, it prevented our ability to diversify our energy supply until just now. So that notion of brownouts and rolling blackouts and all those things, those are very real. And, and it's, you know, it's one thing if the lights go out and we have to, and you guys don't get to hear me lecture. I know that's super disappointing, but if you're in an iron lung, if you're in a, on a respirator or something, you don't have power, that's a, that's a life and death type of uh, thing in terms of that uh, electricity. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Good questions. Um, Suzanne. All right. Hi. So um, just real quick background before my question. Um, I actually am graduating next year, moving to Texas and planning on going to University of Houston for um, their law school. Um, I have a really, really big interest in law and policy and um, in the moving to Texas portion of things, um, I actually expect to be getting a job uh, with uh, with oil and gas. And I'm curious to know like what types of jobs there are for people with law and policy in that field.
field because I haven't had the opportunity to really talk to anybody um, since they're all in Texas. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations. And, um, you know, I'm sure you're, you're going to do great. Thank you. And, uh, you know, the answer is there's tremendous opportunities in, in law, um, in the oil and gas industry, like, like any industry, there are, there are countless issues, legal issues that we were dealing with, uh, large and small and every, everything in between. Um, I work with a couple of, uh, we have a couple lawyers on staff that we work with routinely. Um, I, you know, I'm not a lawyer myself, but we, we work together. We, we review policy. Uh, so there's a ton of work in oil and gas. Um, legislatively, uh, you know, policy development, um, you know, you name it, there, there's tons of opportunity. So, but would um, there, would you have to have, uh, your law degree to go into that or just the, uh, like, since I'm just going to be starting law classes, um, would they still accept me as a, like, I don't know, you know, you know, a thing or two as, and like, as a lowly, okay. as a lowly yeah. graduate. Yeah, as a lowly graduate with that. No, there, yeah, there's, there's, there are opportunities. Um, you know, as sort of, um, first of all, interns, internships. There's, you know, that's a good option. Or if you're looking for full time employment, um, a lot of, uh, you know, like the environmental and regulatory area. It's, um, you know, that might be a good fit for you as well. It takes, you know, analytical ability. But ultimately, you're looking at regulations, which are code, you know, it's, it's, it's very legally based. So all of those would be great fits for you. And, and, you know, it's, it's what I, it's what I did, you know, working in uh, the regulatory space, it's understanding the, uh, the technical concepts, but applying the rules, regulations and laws and verifying that you're abiding by all of them. Um, So there's, you know, if they were Venn diagrams, all of these different areas of expertise would, would have a lot of overlap. And so there's, there's so much room to play within those different overlapping spheres or whatever, whatever, like I said, just keep an open mind and work hard and, and try to learn and, you know, the, your future is going to be bright. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I've just had a lot of issues with people being like, oh, your environmental studies person, and you're going to be going to the oil and gas industry. I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> that's how, how else would I change things? <laughs> like, how, would I, how else would I make a difference, really? So that's, yeah, so I'm trying to keep an open mind about that. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, that. you're welcome. That's very much my story. Uh, same, same thing. I, I would have never imagined working for the oil and gas industry and, and have found that it's, it's been, it's been awesome. It's been great. And it's been super challenging and, and creative and, uh, it's, it's taken all of my abilities to, to solve, you know, some of the problems that have been thrown at me and, and I love it, you know, uh, it's been, it's been fun. Awesome. That's renewed my hope. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, you'll do great. Allison, I, we're, we're getting on you guys. So we're, we'll see if we can go a little bit faster. See if we can get everybody's questions before we have to let uh, Ben go, but Allison, go for it. Yeah. Okay. So my question kind of is in line with, uh, Suzanne because, um, just talking about um, your background and how you felt like, or you didn't think that you would end up kind of in this job or field. And I was just curious if um, being in your job for a while, have you seen um, kind of like a trend where people have also the same background as you, or maybe they're um, kind of leaning towards these jobs where they can put input uh, or, you know, um, like you mentioned, you were, you would only work for a company that would uh, abide by like the policies and regulations. So I was wondering, curious if you see like a trend where people are gradually coming in with that sort of background. So what, 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 what type of background are you, are you referring to, Allison? Um, I guess uh, environmental or, yeah, because that's sort of a pretty broad um, uh, background, but just like uh, kind of people who are like your background, you um, had more of the environmental side versus not so much um, you know, oil and gas or that sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the trend is, uh, is th- there's tons of work in this area. I mean, that there's, there, there's more and more work all the time in this area. Um, 
because of the increasing regulations. And so like if you went back, say, 50 years, um, there, there might not have even been a person like me in, involved, <laughs> you know, or there, or, or there were very few. And as the regulatory um, programs evolved and got more complex and there were more of them, there's just a lot more work to be done. And so, you know, maybe even going beyond the oil and gas industry, the environmental, um, just, you know, the environmental consulting uh, or, uh, you know, whether you're working with a state agency or as a consultant, there's tons of work. There's absolutely, uh, there's, there's no shortage of, of work. You know, maybe it's land use planning you're interested in. Um, but yeah, there, just like I said, just work hard and, and, um, you know, try to learn as much as you can and, and keep an open mind. And there, there's just tremendous opportunities. Awesome. Uh, trying to keep us going a little bit faster. Alex, go for it. Uh, yeah. My, so my question is that, um, the governor imposed like a new like band of like fracking by 2024, I believe. Um, my, my question is like, has WISPA made a statement about it? And if so, like, what are they planning to do now? It's not like if they're like, okay, if banning's done, bye. Like, what's their their their, their goal position, now? Their position on yeah, that. that's a great question. Um, so, in in to answer your question, uh, you know, here here we get back to the old saying that uh, talk is cheap, right? It's one thing to say you're going to do it, which which thus far that's all that's happened. The governor has said he's going to, uh, you know, he's he's going to ban it. But like I said before, that hasn't answered all the questions as to what's going to happen. How are you going to do it? Uh, what is the scientific basis uh, that that, uh, that that you're going to base this policy on? Because you know we still live in a in a in a country where the, the rule of law and um, laws have to be based on facts, data, science. And, and so we feel that um, we feel that the science doesn't support the policy. And, and so he has made his executive order. But now we're getting into the, uh, you know, the more the devil's in the details. It's like, OK, so what does that mean and how do we do it? And we're engaging in that process. It's, it, most of these laws take several years uh, to develop. And we think that. Um, the governor has has scientific and legal uh, uh, gaps in in his policy, and you know we're certainly going to uh, aggressively defend the industry uh, as far as that goes. Cool, Brian. Oh, sorry, no, no Melissa. I think Melissa's next. Apologies, apologies, Melissa, you're next. Hi, um, I was just wondering, does WISPA undertake actions or reparations to limit impacts on marginalized communi communities affected by oil and gas? Yeah, we do. And, and in fact, um, you know, there's, there's a number of policies that our members uh, uh, adhere to in the state of California um, that, um, that, that do minimize those types of impacts on, on those communities. And one thing I'll, I'll point to is recent legislation, AB 617, uh, which, um, which really was, was passed to minimize the impacts of the industry on those, on those types of communities. And we've been working on, on that for the last several years. And so what that, what that did uh, among many, you know, many, many things, but specifically it went to oil and gas producers and it said, if there is a, if there's an air pollution control um, technology that's out there, you're going to apply it, no questions asked. And so we're still in the process of, of doing that, but all the local air pollution control districts are rolling out the rules that will implement that. And that is entirely to minimize impacts on adjacent communities. And uh, as you said, the types of communities that you mentioned. Awesome. Brian. Yeah, so I was wondering, um, what were the, uh, the biggest legal challenges that gas and oil companies have faced? Just because I know like when there's an oil spill, like, everyone's eyes are on the companies. But beyond that, I was just wondering, like, what else? If there's anything. You mean in recent years or, or, or historically? Overall. Yeah. 
The biggest legal challenge, I mean, I look, I think that some of the, the current policies uh, that are that our governor has rolled out, you know, may may end up be, you know, being some of those legal challenges, the, 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 the trickiest ones that we that we end up dealing with. And um, as a trade association, you know, we're, there's always law, you know, there are ongoing lawsuits that we're involved in right now. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it just comes with the territory. But I think in terms of, you know, the greatest ones, I think they're the ones that are that are, are that are coming, uh, you know, now and uh, in, in the in the years to come. Uh, as we as we deal with some of the challenges that we've talked about this evening, how we how we ensure uh, economic viability, uh, reliability, affordability, those types of things, and the legality of some of the potential takings of some of these policies uh, that we foresee. So, I think uh, the the biggest challenges are yet to come. Cool, Alejandro. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think. There were a few other people ahead of me, weren't there? Uh, you have your hand up. So you're the, you're the last one with your hand up. So go for it. All right. Um, pretty much uh, I, was, um, I was wondering since, uh, you know, you showed us um, where the oil pipelines are uh, in the U.S. Um, why don't they reach over here to California, especially since, you know, we're such a big market? Yeah, you know that's that's a tough question. I don't know the the specific uh, you know ins and outs of why why it, it never happened. I know that there were some pipelines that were proposed, and for for whatever reason, you know, for one, it's 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 very hard to build uh, given given all the environmental protections, permitting requirements uh, over multi states. Those are incredibly challenging uh, projects to get approved, and I think a, a, a good example of that is just the recent Keystone Pipeline that we've we've heard about over the years. Uh, it was recently, I think, um, rejected by the Biden administration. You know that that's why it's 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 challenging to to get those approved, and you know if they weren't done years ago, it's it's nearly impossible to get them done now. And so you know the infrastructure is what it is. And, uh, you know, we don't see that that changing. So I think we need to think about that in terms of our environmental policies, generally speaking. If we don't want to have oil and gas, we should not have oil and gas. If we don't want to have the factory, we shouldn't have the factory. But sometimes, uh, oftentimes, unfortunately, environmental laws are used as an indirect way to achieve a policy ends. And, and I think that is bad form in, in many dimensions. So one, it doesn't speak to prioritizing things, but also it, it leads to people thinking that these environmental regulations are all BS, right? These environmental regulations are all just about a power grab for someone and they're not really about protecting, um, you know, certain things. So that, that's a much deeper conversation, but, um, but uh, you know, the 2015, the Plains All-American pipeline, which ruptured in 2015, the 2015 refugio spill, um, that, I mean, you know, the physical outside of the pipe has been fixed, but that oil is not, as yet, never has run again in that pipeline. And that was an existing pipeline, right? That, that's, there's issues with permitting and safety and all this, but, you know, we are six years after that. And if we don't want to have oil and gas, we can have that conversation. But, but we have a pipeline there. There, there are lots of challenges with, um, with making things work properly and that's not even talking about constructing new pipelines or or new infrastructure so um so yeah i, I would just say that that uh, uh i think it's better to have the conversations open as opposed to using backdoor ways to shut down actions or activities and i think that that leads to a lot of ill will towards um regulation in general uh okay uh let's see who else uh alejandro or no wait, wait we already had the one uh Anybody, so I have a couple more questions I can read off the chat real quick before you log out, unless anybody else wants to, to raise their hand or unmute and ask their question. I have a feisty question. A feisty not, question? Yeah, What's I got a feisty, feisty question. <laughs> what are your thoughts on uh, nuclear power? <laughs> it's carbon free. <laughs> I mean, we'll look, uh, my, my industry, uh, you know, so I'll, I'll take off my WISPA hat now and I'll just this is my Ben Oakley hat I'm a resident of San Luis Obispo County 
Uh, I live um, something like 15, 20 miles from Diablo Canyon, the nuclear power plant. And I think it's, you know, again, I'm not, this is, this, this is not my company's, my organization's mm -hmm. position, but I think it's a shame that it's going offline. I think, uh, I think that, uh, you know, we, we need the energy desperately. It provides something like 10% of the state energy supply. And um, I, I just, I, I see it as it's carbon free energy. I think we should support it. But again, not my official position, but that my personal position on nuclear is, I, I think it's, it's an important um, component of, of an energy portfolio. Yeah, I grew up in a Rio Grande, so I feel the exact same way as you. <laughs> oh. Well, that's where awesome. I, I live in a row grand egg. I, um, that's my hometown. A uh, couple of quick questions. People had some noisy backgrounds. So I'll read them. Maybe we'll go real fast and let, let Ben get to dinner or whatever he needs to. He stayed with us very long. Appreciate staying so long with us, man. That was great. Uh, ha happy to be here. Awesome. Okay. So, Ev uh, so Evelyn asks, uh, she's in, she, she's in a, lo a loud area, so she didn't want to ask it. But since California has such strict regulations on oil and gas uh, production, would you, have, would you personally ever consider working in another state because you think it's too regulatory complex, I guess, or, or something of that nature? No, actually, so it's kind of this like twisted, uh, this twisted logic, but uh, you know, my, my job is to deal with the complex uh, policies and, and make sure that we comply with them. And now, you know, uh, you know in my current role is to, is to help uh, uh, craft good policy and so actually there's more I kind of meant here. it in the other way. I'm sorry. I'm like in a less noisier spot now. Okay, good. But like in way, another yeah. way, like if you like say like moving to Texas or another place where they're not as strict, would you consider moving there to like make more of an impact? That's what I meant. Like okay. you get me? Like Oh yeah, just, no, I do. Like I another do. state, so, you get me like that that way. Yeah. Uh, not like I, not like trying to get away with anything that is too strict <laughs> here. That, that's a, yeah. <laughs> No, I, I th look at my, I'm from California and my family lives in California and um, I, I love California and I don't plan on, on leaving. And uh, in, in a lot of ways, you know, we are, we are the leaders in, in many areas. Climate is certainly one of them. And, and so this is where the policy discussion is happening. So for me, there's no better place to be. This is where I want to be. And this is where this is where the challenge is happening, you know, so like nobody, nobody's doing what California is doing um, for better or worse. And, and so the fight is here, the, the challenges are here and like, there's no better place for me to be than, than right here. This is where the action is. This, this is where the is. action is. Yeah. Awesome. That was a great answer. Awesome. Uh, Eduardo is asking, wants to ask about uh, biodiesel and if, and if, and if WISPA is engaged with biodiesel or only only yeah. traditional? Yeah, just a question. I've noticed that there's a, a few biodiesel uh, fuel stations, and I've noticed the battery industry has also implemented more effective batteries. And just with Governor, uh, Governor Newsom implementing the electrical vehicles within like 2030, 2035, if, the, if you guys or the petroleum industry has looked into biodiesel technology kind of making it up to par with the infrastructure for the future i guess yeah actually there's uh one of our members is proposing to uh, in fact two of our members in the bay area are proposing to convert their traditional crude oil refineries to produce um bio biodiesel and, and and bio you know renewable fuels products liquid fuels so you know we're we're um you know, in any of these uh, technology, you know, technology uh, spaces in terms of energy, we're in the middle of it. You know, we, we're, we're, we're the companies that are going to deliver those technologies, are going to deliver the energy. Um, and so, like, like I said, there is a proposal right now in the Bay Area to, to do bio, to do exclusively renewable um, biofuels instead of crude oil. So the transitions here, uh, you know, we, we like to say we've been, we've been um, adapting since the days of horse and buggy. Um, and we're going to continue to, to deal with the changes that, uh, that uh, come our way. Awesome. Uh, two more questions. One, uh, partly related to that, I, I think a continuation of that. Um, Tyler wanted to ask about um, 
shifting the conversation about, so oftentimes he noted that it seems like the, the conversation is how do we get into an alternative energy source or, or another source of energy? But he wants to ask about if, if you guys are involved with the conversation about reducing um, overall energy intensity or energy use, you know, a, as a, a, as the whole pie, rather than talking about shifting pieces of pie around. Um, or not so much. You know, look, I, I know a number of our member companies have um, have carbon emission reduction goals. Um, you know, I. But I think he's talking about overall just energy consumption, not so much emissions per se, but just more efficiency and more efficiency. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's you know I'm I'm kind of drawing a blank here. Um, all good. It's all good. Just wanted like, to like shifting the standard opposed to meeting it. Because you you were talking about like you know like we have all these standards like we need to do these certain things and like yeah I agree but is there like ever a conversation of like stepping that back or are you guys even a part of that? Well, yeah. So the the way it happens is um, you know politics is uh, you know it's referred to as sausage making. Like you don't really want to want to see what goes on behind the scenes, but. You know, in any in it, so the way it plays out is like there will be a there will be a, a bill that's that's brought forth, and you know every year there's there's you know dozens of, of bills in the climate space, and so we're there to talk about what that should look like, and you know if we do this, these are the impacts, and you might want to consider this, and some of the bills are. Um, you know, there, there are things that we're not opposed to. We just say, look, you should consider this, that, or the other, and it might make it a better bill. And some of the legislators that have been, uh, you know, big critics are, of our industry, you know, we'll work with them on, on these types of bills all the time. Uh, so, you know, get, getting back to your question, you know, are there ever, you know, things that we do proactively? I mean, we, it's usually through that conversation, you know, it's, 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 it's making the new regulations and it's a back and forth and a negotiation. And, and then, you know, we end up with, with the policy that we, we end up with. And, and so, um, you know, that, that's really more of the process. Although I, you know, getting back to what I said before, you know, we do have member companies, they do have um, their, their own uh, goals and objectives. Uh, you know, increasingly publicly traded companies have, uh, you know, investor pressure uh, through corporate policies to reduce, um, uh, you know, environmental impacts and to um, make sure that their policies are, are equitable and those types of things. So there's a lot that we're doing in that space for sure. But in terms of setting the policy, it's, it's really more of a negotiation at the, uh, at the legislative level. Cool beans. Right. Thank you. Uh, so I think I think our last question is Clara, unless somebody else has one they want to ask. But um, I think she might be taking a midterm, so I think I'll ask it for her. But this is the classic question, unless I'm wrong. Unless anybody else wants to jump in for a question before we we finish wrapping up here. Okay. So Clara uh, has the classic question that we always ask in these in, in these fora, fora, which is uh, why is why are gas prices so high? And, uh, and, and why, why are they staying so high? So everybody always wants to ask about the current gas price. And whatever year we have you guys in, everybody always says, why is it so high this year? And the next year, like, why is it so high? So, so can you give a, a quick a minute or two about gas prices? Because there's that's always a popular question. Well, yeah. So, so the, the price, gas prices are, are incredibly complex, right? And there's there's many factors that go into you know why why you know you pay what you pay, and 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 for most people, you know they see you know they see the price of, of gas when they go to fill up their car, so that's what they see, but you know the market is is crude oil, so in some ways, you know the crude oil market is 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 one of the main drivers, but there are a whole lot of other factors that go into the price that you see uh, when you fill up your car. So, so what's happening right now? I mean, uh, for one, you know, arguably there's a lot of inflation going on. So there's inflationary pressure. Um, uh, you know, for two, there's been a lot of pressure over time. I talked about activist investors 
it's you know it's made it harder for oil and gas companies to access the capital to increase the supply when we need it. And so now we're starting to see ourselves in a, in a, in a situation where we've uh, collectively, as, as a country, we've underinvested over time in some of these, um, you know, the, this, the, the, the projects that will deliver the crude oil that we need now. And, we're, and that's starting to come back to roost. We're starting to see uh, increased energy, energy costs. Um, now, drilling down to California, uh, there's just a whole lot of additional costs that California uh, imposes that just that, that don't happen in Arizona or other states. We pay something like a dollar twenty two per gallon more on average than uh, than any other state. Uh, sorry, than than the than the average of the rest of the states. And I've got a I've got an interesting graphic uh, that I'd be happy to share with you, Sean. Sure. It shows. So if you look at the gas pump, it'll show you the taxes, and that's a start. But what it doesn't show you are the different environmental programs that are also paid for, including cap and trade, and the low carbon fuel standard. And so when you add all the taxes and you add those additional programs together, it adds up to over dollar twenty a gallon. Uh, to the price of gasoline for for every time that you fill up your car. I'll say the other thing. Another, the the biggest issue is to why uh, well, I don't know about biggest, but but I don't I don't know those numbers you just quoted. But 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 a large issue is also that we um, are trying to address air quality standards in in places like the LA Basin, et cetera. So we have what we call a summer blend of gasoline that is that is only basically only we use it. Um, and so it's like, other gas could be produced anywhere around like the country or whatever, but we have, we have certain standards um, that, that make it more expensive to produce our subsection of, of gasoline. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, the, but the one thing that I've, uh, and I, you don't have to answer this, but the one thing I never get a good answer is people always say, oh, you know, well, when supplies are tight, it, it spikes up, but it, it rarely, if ever, seems to spike down at the same pace. But that's that that that's uh, that's supply and demand and all the. I, I think that's universal, Sean. Yeah, I know. Like I know. you know, the home <laughs> prices, everything else. You know, they they go up quick, but they don't come down quite as fast. Awesome. Well, um, uh, so uh, quick summary here. So thanks. Uh, this has been um, uh, super fun, Ben. Thank you so much for taking the time. I would say a couple things we talked about, a couple themes, just sort of harkening back a little bit off the top of my head. Um, Obviously, the, the issues of carbon emissions and, and climate change are huge um, in this discussion, but also Ben mentioned um, the idea of, of overall energy supply and, and, and regardless of the emissions, uh, you know, where is our energy mix coming from? We talked about the fact that, that we're a massive energy consumer here in California, not necessarily a massive energy producer at the same order of magnitude um, of that production. Um, we talked about uh, a whole bunch of different aspects of, of current policies that are either proposed or, or, or do exist and the challenges of, of, of in a very practical real world sense of meeting those goals um, and, and the difficulties of sort of meshing up our ideals with, with making things happen um, on the ground. Um, and uh, things like, uh, for example, we're only, I think Ben said 68%, 68, 70% of our crude were importing to, to California, um, et cetera. So, um, and we also spent a lot of time talking about uh, career choices. And, and, and again, the idea of that seems like something that I shouldn't be involved with or don't want to be involved with, but we had some good conversation about um, maybe, but maybe that's a place you can make a difference. Maybe someone that some crazy person from, from Utah that studied GIS, maybe he can make an impact and maybe you guys can make an impact in these various industries. So as you get, many of you are getting older and getting ready to graduate, do not restrict yourself when you're thinking of what your career choices are gonna be. Um, um, obviously you, you have some interest and some passion and you should run with that, but, but I wouldn't cut off options of, of other potential employment um, opportunities too soon and, and, and consider all your options. Um, and with that, I think we should all unmute for a second, even if you're noisy, and give Ben a, a nice round of applause and say thank you so much for spending your Thursday night with us, man. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I appreciate it. It's been it's been fun, and I, awesome. I wish I wish you all the best. And uh, you've got some really exciting uh, exciting times ahead of you as you as you plot out your uh, career path. So keep an open mind. 
and work hard and good things will happen. Awesome. Next time we have to do this in person so I can actually buy you a beer or something and we can talk not on not on Zoom. Thanks so much, Ben. Appreciate it. it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank good night. Thank you.